that computer screen. Anyways, now that I got all of your attention, we are so excited for today. You might say, what is today? Well, one, it's Friday, and we have a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Sanchez. Andrew, please unmute yourself. How do you like to be referred to as? Andrew's great. Hey, Reza. Good to see you. Hey, Robbie. Everybody else. Uh, talk to Lena call room here. It's good to see everybody. Oh, that's your call room. That looks nice. You have a computer and everything, huh? Yeah, yeah. This is where the night interns generally go. Fantastic. And congratulations to all of you who have just started your intern year. Very exciting times. If you have any questions, Robbie's cell phone is 724- Yep. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> He's available 24 Let me just tell you that two of those three digits are correct. So- <laughs> 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 only two oh my gosh i i think i think i actually communicate with robbie more than anyone else in my life yet tell cell phone but um i actually why don't we have um madalena and uh shema also mute themselves just say hi to the crowd what you're doing today and then um we can take over the screen and start presenting Awesome. Hey, everyone. My name is Madalena. I'm a medical student, just finished my third year and taking a year off. So I'm in California right now. Uh, it's a very gray day here today. So I'll probably still get outside and uh, taking step two in a few weeks. So I'm also just studying. That's what I'm doing today. What about you, Shema? Hey, everyone. I'm Shema and currently I'm in the library. What I'm doing is eating nuts and so excited for Andrew's case and enjoying the whole CT Silver family here. Yeah. That's a cool library. That was really neat. So, shall we? Rock and roll. All right. So, I'm going to present this for our scribe, Sema, here. It'll be out of kind of the usual VMR order. And this case has kind of been anonymized already a little bit for confidentiality as a preface. So, this is a case of a 75 year old man who presented to a new PCP in the Northeast to establish care. His BMI was 16.7. His symptomatic concerns included increased frequency of chronic diarrhea, unintentional weight loss, bloating, and infrequent night sweats. He had fluctuating episodes of chronic watery diarrhea since he had lived in South Africa more than 15 years ago. After visiting Cuba and Mexico one and a half years ago, the frequency of his diarrhea increased to two to three times a day. So his old PCP had sent stool studies remarkable for a blastocystis infection. That's blastocystis. Antibiotic treatment was deferred as he was noted to have CKD and his symptoms spontaneously had improved at that time. And for his past medical, he had iron deficiency, anemia, osteoporosis, prediabetes, chronic diffuse arthralgias, and hypothyroidism. And that's the first aliquot. Let me know that was a lot, so I'll put some in the chat too. Oh, wow. You know, I, I really, um, I find chronic diarrhea probably the hardest um, chief concern to discuss. And I think that's in large part because when you're collecting this history, there's a description of this chronic longstanding problem. And um, only when you uh, are able to objectively quantify it in the hospital um, or in observed settings, are you, are you confident that it is truly chronic diarrhea? And the ways that you can be misled are twofold. Um, the first is that, um, it is actually um, a storage issue, not a high production of stool, but rather an increased frequency of stool excretion. So it can be an issue with um, the rectum holding the stool um, and things of that nature. Um, and, and the other way you can be misled is that it's actually just a small part of a bigger puzzle. And whenever chronic diarrhea is part of a multi-system disease, the diarrhea is like the ATN of that disease. It's much less likely to be part of the answer. But here the center seems to be focused on diarrhea and its significance is probably augmented by the presence of other GI symptoms such as bloating and the need for diagnostic clarity is further emphasized by the degree of weight loss and the patient's BMI. 
And so that's, that's why I'm inclined to actually open up the space of chronic diarrhea. But I think one foot is still in the door of, are we sure that it is really the core of the patient's problem here? Um, and when you open that door, you're really trying to figure out um, where, is the, where is the diarrhea? Is it a problem with the upper GI tract or a lower GI tract? And what is the nature of that problem? Is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory? That's the crux of our analysis is where is the problem and is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory? The reason that we um, lump in, uh, that we make the distinction between inflammatory and non-inflammatory is most inflammatory diseases have a powerful inflammatory signature to them and are easier to detect. And two, most of them actually involve both the upper and lower GI tract. So there's not much specificity to inflammatory diarrhea. So far here, there is, there is not robust evidence of inflammation in the accompanying symptoms, though you'll make note that there are some subtle ones, including just the sheer amount of weight loss the patient has, but also the plus minus night sweats the patient is having. So it's really a question of, is there actually inflammatory diarrhea? In terms of localization, if you're trying to localize this diarrhea, you don't have much data yet, but the bloating suggests an upper GI source. And also potentially the degree of weight loss is more focused in the upper GI tract because that's where absorption happens. So um, I think this is the exercise is, is this, is diarrhea really the center of gravity of this case or are we being misled? And if it is the center of gravity, is it inflammatory or not? And that's a hard question to definitively answer yet. And if it's not inflammatory, is it upper or is it lower? And those, by the way, are equivalent to osmotic and secretory. An osmotic diarrhea is a diarrhea that localizes to the upper GI tract, and a secretory diarrhea is where stuff is secreted in the colon. Um, but that's the lay of the land um, that I'm grasping, and I'm curious if Prof. Rez has a different lay of the land, or how, and also how he would fill in the details that we already have in terms of the travel and whatnot. I love your geographic map because I concur with it, and I'm ready to go on this epic journey with you, Robbie. Um, and you know, what I find really challenging with this case is that, are we looking at a clinical syndrome that is a few years old? Or are we looking at a clinical syndrome that started decades ago? Because this patient had diarrhea dating back to 15 years prior. And I think the way you tackle this and you reconcile is that you just put yourself in the chronic category. So whatever is driving this patient's presentation to the um, physician uh, is not, or to the clinician, it's not something hyperacute or acute or subacute, it's something chronic. And I think that's gonna be very telling when we start prioritizing the DDX for infections and cancers. When you look at the past medical history uh, with the iron deficiency and osteoporosis, you start seeing that there might be some malabsorption so you have to be a little cautious because the patient is losing significant weight and um, might not be able to get the adequate nu nu nutrients that they need. Osteoporosis can manifest in the context of vitamin D deficiency. And that's something else that the patient might be lacking. So I'm going to be very curious to other labs that might clue us into vitamin deficiencies, like an elevated INR, for example. But um, yeah, I don't have too much more to add right now. I do think that the center of gravity is the chronic diarrhea. Um, and we will just see how this sort of unfolds and what process is driving this patient's clinical syndrome. Wonderful. And just to confirm, he, he did state that he felt he had this kind of fluctuating watery diarrhea for uh, ever since 15 years ago. That's kind of waxed and waned. Um, and for the other past medical, he had the CKD and more on that in a second. So the outpatient labs come back and they show a high corrected calcium of 12.9, albumin of 3.3, total protein of 7.2, creatinine of 3.13, hemoglobin of 8.9, white count and platelets are normal, AST, ALT, Alkfost, and bilirubin were normal. So given his significant hypercalcemia and anemia, he was instructed to present to our hospital for further workup. There he had a MCV of 88, normal LDH of 125, and elevated haptoglobin to 277. We obtained a blood smear that showed no schistocytes or spherocytes, unremarkable platelets. 
the ferritin level was 135. He had a low iron SAT of 11%. So going back to his creatinine, his serum creatinine had fluctuated from as low as 1.5 to as high as 2.6 over the past year, if you track his labs. So they got a UA, it showed one plus protein, six to 210 white blood cells per high powered fields, no blood. And his urine albumin was less than the detectable limit of 12 milligrams per liter. And I'll put all this in the chat in a second as well. I know it's a lot. Um, a couple more things. Uh, kidney ultrasound performed five months prior showed echogenic kidneys consistent with CKD, no cysts, bilateral non-obstructing renal calculi, bilateral pleural effusions were noted, and trace ascites was noted along the right lobe of the liver. And on some further questioning regarding the CKD, no history of hypertension and said use. He wasn't on any nephrotoxic meds. He was taking saw palmetto as a supplement. And his meds were just levothyroxine and denosumab. He got some fluids in the hospital and his UA and urine sediment were normal after the fluids were given. So all of those changes on the UA noted became normal. And his serum creatinine also improved. And that's the salicot. Wow. Um, this is really interesting, Andrew. <laughs> one one strong aliquot after another. A question, the, the calcium, you said, um, based on the hypercalcemia, the patient was given the denusumab, is that correct? I think that was for his osteoporosis. I'm actually oh, not oh, sure perfect. about that. Yeah, yeah. That, that could be a good medication for osteoporosis as well. Um, I believe it's a, a rank L inhibitor, rank ligand inhibitor. And what that does is it basically increases osteoblast activity relative to osteoclast activity. So oftentimes um, it would cause actually a decrease in the overall calcium. And we, we can use this medication for patients that have hypercalcemia of, of malignancy. It's a medication that we often use. There's something striking here, folks. If I don't have my maps confused, <laughs> which I don't think I do, um, there's something very striking here. You have someone with CKD or kidney disease, so they have impaired one alpha hydroxylation. Agreed? So you need one alpha hydroxylation of vitamin D to get calcitriol, which increases reabsorption from the GI tract of calcium. So that's why patients with kidney disease often have hypocalcemia. So this patient's hypercalcemic despite the kidney disease. Then you have this very powerful um, anti-resorptive therapy, the Nusimab, that should bring down the calcium too. So despite kidney disease, despite the Nusimab, and then on top of all of that, you have diarrhea, like severe diarrhea. Where does calcium get absorbed in the body? From the GI tract. A lot of calcium exists in the bone, but the way we maintain the homeostasis is through the GI tract. So you have three hits to as why this patient should have a low calcium. And here we are with an elevated calcium. The important question is to ask why. You know, it's always easy to find an abnormality and correct it. But you have to ask, why is that abnormality there? So I wouldn't look at this calcium of 12.9 and be like, oh, this is just moderate hypercalcemia. To me, this is severe hypercalcemia. So more so than the diarrhea, actually, this calcium has taken center stage for me. The calcium has taken center stage. So I'm going to put the calcium on the base of the pyramid. And as we go through our DDX for the calcium, we have to ask, can that diagnosis also explain the other findings? What I'll do is I'll start with the hypercalcemia, but I would love for Robbie to comment on everything else and how the differential diagnosis that I build may be applicable to the other aberrations. All right. <laughs> Aberrations. Oh, I was so waiting bad. for it. You yeah, know, no, I am. Uh, uh, my my response time is slow today, but I uh, I'm here. I'm here. I no, promise. no, it's okay. What, what you lack in response time, you make up for in your discussion. So 
With hypercalcemia, the first step is to ask the question. Actually, you know, even before you ask this question, when you have severe hypercalcemia, which I'm going to categorize this patient as, the top leading causes include malignancy, hyperparathyroidism, and milk alkali syndrome. We don't get a flavor of milk alkali syndrome here, at least based on the information that Andrew has provided. Um, but then if you take a very systematic approach, is it PTH mediated or non-PTH mediated? So the way you address that is you send a PTH level. You could also use the chloride to phos ratio because PTH is phos wasting. The body reabsorbs chloride to maintain electrical neutrality. So in patients who have a PTH or PTHRP mediated process, they have a high chloride to phos ratio. Um, let me just look at this. Okay. So um, PTH, and but high, primary hyperparathyroidism would be odd to cause all of this. It would be odd. And so you're already going beyond um, primary hyperparathyroidism more, if this is PTH, more into the, the tertiary or secondary causes of elevated PTH. But then the non-PTH mediated processes include PTHRP, vitamin D excess, granulomatous disease, lytic lesions, like bone metastasizing lytic lesions, and then a few less common etiologies that um, I won't expand upon. The last comment I'll make is whenever you start saying fluid here, fluid there, fluid everywhere, um, you have to say just panceritis. Like that should translate into your mind that this process is causing inflammation of those serosal layers. So to summarize and then give the mic to Robbie, what started out as very vague um, is now we have like actually a pivot point being the calcium. Now we have to try to see how we can link in everything else with this hypercalcemia. This uh, yo, is absolutely superb. You're here, there, and everywhere, Prof. Rez. Um, and you know, so the, the accompanying data, the accompanying data is actually really, really important. And I'd say the most important accompanying data is the lack of bone pain. So most patients who are hypercalcemic to this extent have exquisite pain from metastatic bony disease. And the lack of that is a very powerful pertinent negative. And if this is malignant, in fact, it's going to be a perineoplastic malignant process, very unlikely uh, to be a metastatic bone disease in the absence of pain. And so um, you ask yourself, well, what kind of perineoplastic disease processes do this, especially a disease process that lasts for 15, presumably 15 years? Again, that's an assumption, right? And the only cross that I, that I can come up with is potentially neuroendocrine tumor. And neuroendocrine tumors, a variety of them are associated with hypercalcemia, including a VIPoma, either directly or through the association, um, extensive associations like a multiple endocrine neoplasia through causing primary hyperparathyroidism. So as Prof. Red said, primary hyperpara is insufficient to do this, but if it's coming together with a neuroendocrine tumor slowly over time, that might be a match that we find here. But to tell you the truth, I don't think that's what's going on here because of the degree of malabsorptive features that this patient has. And the only neuroendocrine tumor that comes with malabsorption is a gastronoma. Um, once you start mentioning gastronoma, you should probably pause and anchor yourself in reality. And that reality here <laughs> is that... Um, that apart from the hypercalcemia, there's not much else of a prominent signature in the labs. The UA findings wash away and so does the kidney dysfunction with labs. And so you're trying to, trying to ask yourself, how do you make progress outside the calcium? The calcium will take you very far. Understanding the mechanism of hypercalcemia will go very far. And so when we're in the world of, hey, hypercalcemia that's extensive, part of a systemic syndrome with no bony lesions, you're either dealing with a perineoplastic phenomenon, or you're dealing with a granulomatous infection in most cases. So the question here is, are, are we on a hunt for a granulomatous disease process? And the answer is yes, we should be early on. Um, and you know, when you see all this travel history in this patient, you certainly should think about it even more. But then again, then again you hit another wall when you say, hey, 15 years? Mm, I don't buy it. But is there a granulomatous infection that can last for 15 years and cause hypercalcemia? The answer is yes. And I only know of one, and that's Whipple's disease. So when you say somebody has chronic arthralgias, malabsorptive diarrhea, eventually gets hypercalcemia, I'd worry about that. 
And yeah, it's a rare infectious disease process. But I think that all the things that we're mentioning now tell us, hey, why don't we get a CT for this patient who's having diarrhea to see if there's a mass that we can detect or it is a neuroendocrine tumor. And I really think that the answer is not so much in the kidney, it's in analyzing the calcium and taking a look at that upper GI tract. There's too many clues um, telling us to go there, to not go there early and quick. And why quick? Look at that BMI. That BMI is 17 in a, is, is um, telling you that this is, this is one of the equivalents of sinus tachycardia of chronic disease to have a BMI. So you potentially have a curable disease, a neuroendocrine tumor or rare granulomatous infection. But let's step back. We're assuming all this is linked. It may not be. The 15 years may be a red herring. And whenever you have somebody who's surviving for so long on a BMI, on a BMI this low, the base rate would tell you that there is, there is likely to be an eating disorder alongside it. So exploring that um, curiously and gently in an older adult in terms of getting a sense of what their access to food is, what their desire to eat is, is going to be really, really important. And crossing small dots, like what their dentition is, the, the basics are really, really important because of how profoundly ill he is. But I think a CT and a and an EGD in parallel with understanding the mechanism of hypercalcemia is probably a good move. And folks, only on CP solvers do we skip the exam and we just want the data because that's, that's reality. The exam is going to do nothing here. I, yeah, this, I'm kind of presenting this in kind of a real world fashion because this is, you'll see in the following aliquots that it becomes a bit of a roller coaster in terms of the, the workup selection. It, this case could have been done in so many different ways in real life. So I'll, I'll present it to you as it was given to us. And to fill in some history, yeah, for the exam, he was just very cachectic, no joint effusions, nothing interesting uh, on the exam. And somebody asked about smoking. I don't recall his smoking history. And in terms of food restriction, he's just been very frustrated about all this weight loss, abdominal pain, diarrhea, or um, bloating rather, um, and then really his diffuse arthralgias. It had bothered him for many, many years, and he was just very frustrated at a lack of diagnosis overall at this time. So for the next aliquot, his parathyroid PTH level was 14.6, which is just below normal limits. The PTH RP was 17 normal. D125 vitamin D was 61, which is upper normal, but not high. Uh, SPEP showed no abnormal bands. Uh, serum immunofixation showed monoclonal lambda light chain. Serum free light chains were normal for kappa free light chains at 10.9. He had an elevated lambda free light chain of 49. And a capital lambda ratio was 0.22, which is just below our normal range of 0.26. Uh, urine immunofixation showed monoclonal free lambda light chain. A total body MRI showed multiple scattered sub-centimeter intermediate to low signal abnormality intermixed with hematopoietic marrow throughout the body. Oh, Andrew, it gets more and more intriguing. Can I just ask one clarifying question? So it sounds like the SPEP detected a monoclonal protein. Is that is that right? The SPEP did not show monoclonal protein. Oh, yeah. Can you can you remind me what the what the analysis was that was positive on the monoclonal assessment? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm happy. So our our hematologists felt that while these paraprotein findings could be concerning for light chain light chain amyloid. Yep. The ratio at the time was not greater than 100. So they had considered this uh, borderline high risk light chain MGUS. Gotcha. Yeah, um, I think uh, that's, that's, very, that's very helpful. So I think when you, when you have a light chain only um, monoclonal process, um, that gets a little bit tricky because analyzing the significance um, deviates from the algorithm that we usually use, which is the amount and also the type of heavy chain. So as a general rule, when you have a monoclonal that's positive, um, you wanna know what, if it's IgG or IgM and you wanna know the amount. And in light chains, you don't have that data. And so you're really leaning on the ratio. Um, the ratio 
uh, is um, of capital lambda, lambda is telling in um, diseases where the amount of uh, paraprotein is informative, but there's diseases where it's not so much the amount of um, paraprotein. Things like AL amyloidosis actually have to do with the configuration of the protein. So it can be a small amount a paraprotein causing issues. So I think it's hard to not, it's hard to ignore this result when you don't have a clear answer, but I would say the most common cause of a paraprotein is a paraprotein of unclear or uncertain significance. Um, so that's what I took away from that aliquot. Um, I'm curious, Prof Rez, what you made of it and, um, and if the imaging findings in the calcium analysis did anything for you. Yes. Um... Well, I'll tell you, it didn't, didn't, what it didn't do for me is give me a final diagnosis, <laughs> but it has uh, prompted some thinking. One, I, you know, Robbie, we, one of our earliest episodes on CP solvers with Charmin and Air Salon was this beautiful concept of when normal is not normal, when normal is not normal. So let me ask the audience. When you have hypercalcemia under normal circumstances, like if the parathyroid gland was behaving appropriately, what would you expect the PTH to be? Thank you, Madalena. Exactly right. The PTH should be low. Here, it's flirting with being normal, meaning is the PTH actually low enough or not? So, Robbie, when we thought that with the PTH, we can go beyond PTH or non-PTH, I'm not yet ready to dismiss the fact that this can't be PTH mediated um, hypercalcemia because um, you would expect the, the PTH to be low in the context of hypercalcemia. So Andrew, what you've done with that PTH is kept both doors open in my mind, meaning both a PTH mediated process and a non-PTH mediated process. I will tell you something. Um, we've ruled out that PTHRP mediated processes. Here, if you get a 125 vitamin D, um, it will be very helpful because if you have a high, very high PTH, you'll have a high 125 vitamin D. You'll have a high 125 vitamin D. But if the 125 vitamin D is very high right here, then it really emphasizes a granulomatous process. So I think one test that's going to be critical in our analysis here is going to be a 125 vitamin D because we have a vitamin D, but we don't have the 125 vitamin D yet. The other thing I'll mention is this. You look at that. No, Prof. I, I, want, yes. yeah, I just saw Andrew. I, I want to make sure you, uh, we learn from you. So he has the 125 and it's high normal at 61. Oh, Teach us, God. please. This is so helpful because I will tell you, um, Many times I get distracted and I go on. A, and this time Robbie was nice. Sometimes I talk for five minutes on a data point that I erroneously missed. But anyways, so here we have, we do have a one. This is super helpful, super helpful. Because since the 125 vitamin D is elevated, it's not due to the PTH is just barely elevated. So now I'm shifting to a 125 vitamin D mediated hypercalcemia. So the question is, what leads to elevations in 125 vitamin D? I'll tell you what, it's not the patient's kidney. You get 25. So when you get D, it goes to the liver and you get 25 D, calcidiol. Then that goes to the kidney. You want alpha hydroxylate 25 D. And now you're at calcitriol or active vitamin D. So where else can one alpha hydroxylation occur? And it's not in this patient's kidney. It's through granulomas. And the question is, what granulomatous processes? Well, usually when you have granulomatous processes leading to high 125 vitamin D, it comes down to infections, lymphoma, or sarcoid. Um, the other causes of granuloma is like primary biliary cholangitis, um, Crohn's, and uh, giant arteritis, EGP, I think less likely. So here it's infection, sarcoid, lymphoma. The truth is, um, this is where it's gonna be helpful. This is when you have a schema. So for the lymphoma, we want an LDH. The sarcoid is a diagnosis of exclusion. 
but we have to lead with possible granulomatous infection. I'm going to pass the mic back to Robbie to talk about granulomatous infections uh, because no one does it better than him. But I do want to make one more comment on the bone marrow. This is what's so fascinating. Andrew, we were at, in Philadelphia discussing an unknown, and uh, it was a fun one. And there were marrow abnormalities, and, and, and the patient had vitamin C deficiency. The patient had vitamin C deficiency. Um, and we learned, well, Robbie knew this. What, what I learned was that the marrow, in response to nutritional deficiencies, can start acting funny because it's trying to make up for the nutritional deficiency. So I don't know right now if that marrow is part of the underlying process, because I look at the platelet count, I look at the Y count, they're normal. If those were down, then I'd be more concerned for granulomas infiltrating the marrow. I'm still open to that possibility, but I'm stepping back to say, maybe the marrow is nonspecific and related to nutritional deficiency and the marrow doing what it should be doing and trying to make up for you know, the nutritional deficiency. Mike to Robbie to talk about um, granulomas. Yes, sir. Thank you for that setup. I completely agree. I think this case is really like when we were like hypercalcemia without bone lesions, the, all the perineoplastic analysis is less revealing except lymphoma. And so the question is, is there a granulomatous infection? And, and, and you know, granulomatous infections are actually just infections that are, live outside the body and the body reacts to them by making a granuloma. So in, you can simplify your approach to granulomatous infections by asking, where is the infection coming from? And there are four places that you can acquire infections from the lungs, from the skin, from the GI tract, and from the GU tract. And the GU tract is easy. It's lymphogranuloma venerum or LGV and mycobacterium bovis instilled as part of treatment for bladder cancer. So that's GU acquisition. Pulmonary acqu acquisition is the one that's most notorious and has many organisms like nocardia, mycobacterium TB, NTM, and all the endemic mycoses. Um, and the skin acquisition is really interesting and can happen because of leprosy, can happen because of Bartonella or sporotrichosis. I'm moving the GI acquisition because we've been talking GI all day long, right? So what are the organisms that come from the GI tract? And here, um, that list would be a brucella, mycobacterium bovis, which is acquired through unpasteurized milk, salmonella, listeria, Whipple's disease, and toxicara. Toxicara is a cat-borne, um, uh, is a cat-facilitated food-borne disease. And what are the two infections that have a chronic time course on this list in the GI tract? It's Whipple's and Brucella. And so um, it's amazing how the hypercalcemia tells you to look even closer at the GI tract and, and also tells you the nature of how to look. So yeah, I think your, evalu your evaluation here in terms of what to practically do isn't changed by what we talked about earlier, which is you've now taken a picture. You don't see any obvious lesions in terms of neuroendocrine tumors. So let's take a look at that upper GI. Um, but in the meantime, you might get um, an epidemiologically appropriate analysis of all the granulomatous infections with a special highlighted bold ones for the ones coming from the GI tract. And so there's many ways you can test for brucella, but for this time course, antibodies are your best bet. And there's better and better ways to test for Whipple's disease, including salivary PCR. Um, but of course, the best test, I believe, is still that EGD um, with biopsy. But yeah, um, I, think, I think this patient really, really needs a gastroenterologist, um, uh, but also potentially an infectious disease doctor. Definitely not me. I can't do anything about this, except pass the mic to Dr. Sanchez to tell us more. This analysis is brilliant. Uh, I'm excited for you guys to get the final two aliquots here. So here's the penultimate one. A bone marrow biopsy was performed. It showed less than 5% clonal plasma cells, normocellular marrow, and scattered small epithelioid granulomas. A CT scan of the chest without contrast showed no hyalur adenopathy, no perilymphatic nodules, no fibrotic lung changes. The small bilateral pleural effusions were redemonstrated that were previously seen on that ultrasound. And on review of prior imaging, a thyroid ultrasound was remarkable for a diffusely hyperemic thyroid gland. The TSH was 153, so very high, and an anti-TPO antibody test was negative. The ACE level was 71 normal. Quant gold HIV screen 
histoplasma and strongyloides antibody tests were negative. You know, um, I'll just jump in and interpret the bone marrow um, and, and um, leave the more interesting abnormality for Prof. Rez, which actually, honestly, I'll just say I have no idea how to interpret this thyroid stuff. I'm completely stumped about it. Um, so the bone marrow is really important because it tells you that you're not dealing, likely not dealing with a plasma cell related issue because um, most plasma cell diseases require more than 10% plasma cells. But you got to be careful. We divide paraprotein related diseases into those that are related to quantitative paraprotein issues like multiple myeloma or qualitative issues. And qualitative issues, the best example is AL amyloid. Only 10% of patients with AL amyloid have more than 10% plasma cells on their bone marrow. Most have less. So we have not ruled out a qualitative paraprotein related issue with this bone marrow, but thankfully can tell the patient he probably does not have multiple myeloma or a quantitative paraprotein issue. All right, Prof. Rez, <laughs> Mike to you. <laughs> I'm scrambling whenever I'm asking for more data, you know, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I'm scrambling in the chat. Um, so this is fascinating. I think, so let's interpret the, <clears throat> the, the thyroid function test, but before we interpret the thyroid function test, I want you to ignore the TSH level ask yourself the question, does this patient's presentation, is it consistent with thyroid disorder? So is it consistent with mixed edema coma or severe hypothyroidism? Is it consistent with thyroid toxicosis or elevated you know, thyroid levels? Um, and yes, th thank you, Caroline. The, the chat is, <clears throat> Absolutely right. So hypothyroidism would be very odd. This would be just a very odd manifestation, right? Like you're talking fatigue, weight gain, cold intolerance, maybe, you know, hair loss and um, you can get edema in the lower extremities. It's just not consistent with hypothyroidism. Thyroid toxicosis can definitely lead to hyperdefecation. It could lead to weight loss. In fact, one of the pearls is that if a patient loses weight despite maintaining their usual caloric intake, you should think about thyroid toxicosis, you should think about pheochromocytosis, pheochromocytoma, and you should think about diabetes. So could um, thyroid toxicosis be part of this? It could be based on, you know, it, it, it can't explain everything, but it could be. So now let's look at the TSA. So Andrew just gave us a T TSH value that is so high, right? It's so high. Like, I don't think I've ever, Andrew, what's the upper limit of normal just so people can grasp the, the severity of this? Don't say it's 151 is upper limit of normal. <laughs> it's it's 4.2. Okay. I did that for two reasons. One is for you to grasp the severity and two, to let me think a little longer. So we have a very high TSH level. So we have to be very systematic here. We're talking about the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid access. The, the hypothalamic releases that thyroid releasing hormone. The pituitary gland releases the thyroid stimulating hormone that acts on the thyroid gland to release um, the thyroid hormone. So if the TSH is very high, it can be very high if the thyroid level is nil. If the thyroid level is nil, but we already know that this can't be the case here, right? Because the patient is on levothyroxine and none of this is consistent with hypothyroidism. So that's one reason why the TSH, basically if someone's in mixed edema coma, but then you look at the clinical syndrome, you're like, there's no way this patient's in mixed edema coma. So you rule that hypothesis out. How, why else could the thyroid stimulating hormone be very elevated? Well, if you have ectopic secretion, ectopic secretion. So I can't, now I'm using analogical reasoning. Like you can think in, in terms of like ACTH, how we can have ectopic secretion. Could there be a phenomenon where something is just releasing this TSH? Um, that's when it would actually be helpful to have a free T4 to see if it's actually acting on the pituitary gland. 
So um, could there be ectopic release of TSH? And then thirdly, could there be something just interfering with the assay? Is this patient taking, um, you know, biotin, which usually mimics Graves' disease? It doesn't mimic hypothyroidism, but you wonder if there is some kind of supplement that can interfere with the assay and give you a very high TSH level. So in all honesty, Barabi, like, and I want to discuss this abnormality with you because it's so striking and we have to pay attention to it. I'm thinking a couple of things. Um, I don't think this is reflecting the patient's thyroid level because they're on levothyroxine and I just don't get a flavor of myxedema coma. Could there be ectopic secretion uh, from like a tumor or something? That would be new to me, to be honest. Or thirdly, could there be something interfering with the lab, like a supplement or even something endogenously? Um, let me ask you, RG, what do you think, my man? Oh, I think it's so hard. It's hard not to be uh, perplexed by this. Um, and I think, I think that I'm, so, I'm stuck and I would love, uh, I think I can only make progress if we know if the patient has a high T3 or T4, because if the T3 or T4 are high, then you're like actually dealing with a hyperthyroid state with a high TSH, which would make you wonder, does the patient have a pituitary adenoma um, or something of that nature? Um, it's also weird for a patient to um, have, if they are in fact hypothyroid, the most common cause of hypothyroidism, which is Hashimoto's, is unlikely to be TPO negative. So if he truly is hypothyroid, you're dealing with a rare cause, which it might be because he's been in iodine deficient areas for most of his life, but it makes you start to wonder about less common causes of hypothyroidism, such as consumptive hypothyroidism or infiltration of the thyroid gland or all sorts of funky stuff. But I think you really have to know, is the T, are you dealing with hyperthyroidism with a high TSH or hypo, are you dealing with a high T4 and TSH or a low T3, T4 and TSH? Because the schema is just too complicated to try to predict without that data. So I have a headache thinking about this and that's all I can tell you. I can't wait to learn from Andrew. Okay, so I, I don't have the data. I'll say that the free T4 is low, though. Um, and this is the final aliquot. That's helpful, he was, right? Because we match that with our clinical syndrome, you know, the other clues. So I'm glad. So this is the final aliquot. Uh, he was discharged, and he had a follow-up appointment one month later with a hematologist for MGUS and anemia. He was noted to have bilaterally decreased vibratory sensation in his legs, so they sent a VEGF level to evaluate for POEM syndrome. It was elevated at 320, and then he had renal follow-up one month later as well with a recurrent increase in his creatinine into 3.03, which prompted a renal biopsy. This demonstrated granulomatous interstitial nephritis. Uh, empiric prednisone was started for a presumed supplement-induced interstitial nephritis as he was taking the saw palmetto. Uh, I guess there was a question of maybe him taking other supplements. So with the empiric prednisone, his serum creatinine initially improved to 1.73 from the 3.03, but he again had a recurrent increase to 2.03 after two months of the prednisone treatment. So the next tests will reveal the final diagnosis. All right. Awesome. Um, we'll, we'll tag team this. In general, everyone feels better with steroids initially. Then they end up really manifesting. Um, if they have an underlying infection, for example, uh, it becomes worse Like, and it, and it shows itself. So initially everyone feels better. I think this diagnosis of poems is interesting. So the patient had this polyneuropathy and what POEM stands for is polyneuropathy, organomegaly, endocrinopathy, monoclonal spike, and skin changes. Of all of these, I think the monoclonal spike, and I believe the polyneuropathy are required, two of these are required for the diagnosis of POEMS. And um, POEMS is just, you know, uh, you can put it on the plasma cell dyscrasia plus syndromes. That's the way I think about POEMS. But when you say poems, like the part that I can't reconcile with that diagnosis is the granulomatous disease that this patient has. That's difficult because of all the cancers, the one that causes granulomas is lymphoma. 
could you have like a plasma lymphoblastic blah 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 maybe <laughs> maybe um like meaning every disease exists on a spectrum and you wonder about um lymphoma here uh i just for poems and granuloma that just doesn't connect um and i don't think we were told of organomegaly um, and then I think the response to steroids is quite telling that the patient's condition worsened despite steroids. So if you were to ask me, honestly, I would be worried about um, a granulomatous infection, one that is invading the marrow, invading the nerves, causing the polyneuropathy, invading the kidney, leading to in interstitial nephritis. Um, of those infections, I think Robbie already mentioned all of them, um, but thinking of tuberculosis and uh, yeah, that's sort of where I am. I'm open to lymphoma as well, but I don't like poems as the final diagnosis. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think, um, I think this case is really, really tricky and highlights a lot of diagnostic challenges. And I think it's so good that we speculated that we might find granulomas and you found them. And I think that while um, the, the journey towards the answer of a granulomatous disease process uh, uh, can land in lymphoma, you have to step back and say, well, what, um, um, what are the proximal journeys? And the proximal journeys is infection. And we have a future ID doctor here who hasn't told us a single infectious disease serology. Right, so that in terms of your CPS uh, skills, you have to predict that. Come on, um, so you can't diagnose a granuloma without like a histourine antigen already. Like nothing. There's no. There's no interferon yet. There's nothing. So I think that is a clue that this is an infection to begin with. But I, I would say that you know this is. Um, I would spend in real life. I would spend a lot of time really trying to gain confidence on when the story begins for this patient. And if it really begins 15 years ago, and I, if I get confidence at the bedside that it's 15 years, I can't think of any explanation except Whipple's disease. If it really begins 15 years ago. Um, now, in real life, it probably doesn't, um, in which case I think the spectrum would extend to brucella and TB, especially Mycobacterium bovis, which often is, is prevalent in Mexico, um, much more prevalent than anywhere else, and usually has extrapulmonary GI-focused disease. Um, and so I think um, I, I really, really would be very optimistic for this person, at least now, because there's a decent chance you could get him to feel much better if it's one of these three infections. But this is a, this case is a classic presentation of a very rare disease. Um, um, a, a, a middle-aged to upper older adult man, when he had the disease that began, a middle-aged man with a arthritic syndrome that develops into a chronic, slowly progressive wasting diarrhea who has granulomas on biopsy. So you have to rule it out. Um, and I, I hope for his sake that he has it because of all the things that we're thinking about, it's the most treatable and has the best prognosis. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, go, go for it. Oh, I just said enlighten us, please. Oh, enlighten, enlighten us. Um, I'm smiling because I, I threw you all so many curveballs, and you, you know, obviously, you're you're correct here. <laughs> so um, this is how things went down. He went to see his GI doctor because he had Barrett's esophagus as well, and he was just getting surveillance endoscopy. And he finally considered the diarrhea in the recent workup. And during that endoscopy, they actually took a duodenal biopsy showing patchy villus blunting, chronic active duodenitis and stromal foamy macrophages associated with vocally prominent lymphatics. And they did a PCR test for trophorima whippleii that was positive. And this is really how the case went down and um, very impressive how you all dissected all of that given kind of the roller coaster of how the data was presented. Um, I'll give you my reflections on this in a second, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this. Andrew, I, I'm looking forward to your reflections. Um, thank you for presenting this unbelievable case. Robbie? 
Yeah, no, I agree. I think, um, you know, there, there's, there are some diagnoses that are just, you know, I think a classic presentation of Whipple's disease is actually this topsy-turvy workup. So to be real, it is very hard to diagnose this infection before this because it's so rare and so indolent. It literally takes one, it's almost like it, it wastes you by taking one cell a day. Like literally it's so slow and indolent. So I think it's actually a clue to the final answer, just how hard it was to diagnose this condition. Um, so if you are in this space, my real reflection is you are taking care of this patient. It is so easy to give up and be like, nobody's figured it out for 15 years. So what am I going to do today? But that's actually another classic feature of this illness. So all the more reason to keep, keep going, even in patients who haven't been figured out for 15 years. All right, Andrew, Mike, to you. Okay, so this is my analysis. Uh, in this case, an older man with a longstanding history of diarrhea, failure to thrive, and diffuse arthralgias presented with findings of hypercalcemia, anemia, CKD, pleural effusions, and a diffusely hyperemic thyroid gland. The initial workup was focused on identifying a paraproteinemia, which uncovered the serum monoclonal lambda light chain and the urine monoclonal free lambda light chain. So given his arthralgia's weight loss and lab findings possibly consistent with myeloma, the bone marrow biopsy was pursued. The findings of less than 5% plasma cells left him with a diagnosis of MGUS. However, he continued to have progressive kidney failure. And the findings of pleural effusions and a diffusely hyperemic thyroid gland were kind of overlooked if you look back at the hospital courses. Uh, although a subsequent kidney biopsy demonstrated granulomas, the diagnosis of Whipple's as a unifying diagnosis didn't enter, occur until a duodenal biopsy revealed uh, the Whipple eye by PCR. So classic Whipple's disease is dominated by a symptomatic triad of diarrhea, weight loss, and malabsorption. It does represent a systemic infection, and GI symptoms are often preceded by insidious onset extraintestinal symptoms. The most common extraintestinal symptom found in more than 60% is joint symptoms, with intermittent migratory polyarticular and oligoarticular arthritis being typical, neurologic involvement resulting in cognitive and ophthalmic findings, and cardiac involvement resulting in blood culture negative infective endocarditis are also common. So PCR testing is now used in, con in conjunction with PS staining of small bowel biopsies to make the diagnosis in most cases. However, cases of localized extra intestinal whipples, i.e. without classic GI symptoms, are increasing, increasingly recognized. And in such cases, PCR testing and PAS staining of extra intestinal tissues, such as bone marrow or kidney, can also be helpful uh, given a decreased yield of those tests in the small bowel. Uh, additionally, the finding of non-caseating granulomas in extraintestinal tissues can mimic sarcoid. This may prompt suspicion as well for the diagnosis. So while less common granulomatous kidney and bone marrow disease uh, observed here is well described, as alluded to, um, we had two incidental findings that may have prompted suspicion. I think what I've ignored in my analysis here is really that the chronic diarrhea being the center of gravity was kind of overlooked. If we go back to kind of the, the myeloma workup that was done, I think they were really hammered in on the myeloma workup and it kind of overlooked the chronic history of diarrhea. Um, but that aside, um, the kidney ultrasound showing the incidental bilateral pleural effusions um, and then trace societies was also kind of odd. Uh, we alluded to serositis and kind of a disseminated infection or any cause of disseminated inflammation that can cause findings like that. Um, that could have been a tip off. And then the thyroid ultrasound showing the diffusely hyperemic thyroid gland. So hypothyroidism secondary to Whipple's disease has also been described. Um, and it's been shown to be reversible actually in terms of primary hypothyroid in one case report. Uh, so that's that. I think the final point that was already made by Robbie is you just need to have a high suspicion for this in order to make the diagnosis because you really need tissue of some sort to do this. Otherwise, they'll just go on living their life without it. But really challenging case to diagnose in real life as demonstrated here and as discussed. And that's all I got. Thanks for going along the ride with me. Andrew, how did the patient do? Uh First of all, amazing teach. I felt I felt like we were sitting in an NEJM CPS exercise. You did a terrific, like superb job. Great teaching. How did the patient do? That's a great question. And thank you. Um, he actually is having a progressive decrease in his creatinine and, and symptomatically he's feeling uh, better. His symptoms aren't fully resolved, but better. 
And also for, for full disclosure, I intercepted this patient in the ID clinic right when the diagnosis was made. So I wasn't involved in any of this care. Everything done here is being done for a case report. That's all I got. Absolutely superb. Thank you. A real trade for all of us to learn from this. And, you know, what you've done is, in addition to hopefully publishing it as a case report, as you just alluded to, I think you're spreading the word. And um, hopefully each of these, um, everyone in attendance here and listening can get that much, um, that, much that's, that much more reps in this rare disease. All right, Madalena, Mike, to you, my friend. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, Andrew, that was just such a phenomenal case presentation. And Robbie and Reza, as always, just I learned so much and clearly was running out of room for these teaching points. Uh, so to jump in, so we started with chronic diarrhea. And the first thing we warned is, can we be misled by this chief concern? So you, before diving into chronic diarrhea, you want to think, is this actually a storage issue rather than profuse diarrhea? And also, is it part of a multi-systemic disease and not actually the center of gravity here? But when you do kind of go down uh, the schema for chronic diarrhea, you want to think, is this inflammatory versus non-inflammatory? And some of the signs of inflammatory diarrhea can include night sweats or weight loss. Um, if you're in the non-inflammatory bucket, you want to localize. So is this an upper GI or osmotic process? And signs that could point to that include bloating. Uh, or is this a lower GI or secretory process? And weight loss can actually point to that because the lower GI is the site of absorption. Uh, when we got more information about labs and we saw the high calcium, that was that kind of became the center of gravity for us because it was high calcium despite these three um, you know, contradictory factors. So the denosumab, the chronic kidney disease, and the diarrhea. So denosumab, um, Reza taught us as a rank L inhibitor, which increases osteoblast activity and ultimately lowers calcium. And then in chronic kidney disease, we walk through the pathophysiology, you have impaired 1-alpha hydroxylation, which is required for vitamin D, activa uh, vitamin D activa activation, uh, which ultimately increases calcium from the GI tract. So it was strange that we had this high calcium despite those factors. Uh, when you have severe hypercalcemia, we learned that the top causes um, to consider are malignancy, hyperparathyroidism, and milk alkali syndrome. And in this case, the lack of bone pain was uh, really a pertinent negative for us. Uh, to approach hypercalcemia, you wanna think, is this PTH or non-PTH mediated? And you can also use the chloride uh, FOS ratio. So a PTH mediated process would have a high calcium and FOS ratio. Uh, so for PTH mediated, you can think of primary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. For non-PTH mediated, you can think of PTHRP, vitamin D excess, uh, granulomatous processes, and lytic lesions. And important here we talked about was the 125 uh, vitamin D mediated uh, hypercalcemia because uh, when you have 125 uh, vitamin D levels, you wanna think of where does one alpha hydroxylation occurs? It occurs in the kidney or it occurs in granulomas. And so for granulomas, you wanna think of infections, lymphoma and sarcoid. And Robbie walked us through a really helpful approach to granulomatous infections. And you wanna think of where is the infection coming from? And it could be one of four places. So the lung, like nocardia, mycobacterium, TB, endemic mycoses, the skin, including leprosy and Bartonella, GI tract, brucella, mycobacterium bovis, salmonella, listeria, whipples, and toxicara, and the GU, LGV, and mycobacterium bovis. And ultimately, because of the uh, chronic time course, we prioritized salmonella and then ultimately whipples disease, um, which we learned from Andrew, uh, is commonly presents with diarrhea or kind of G, uh, GI manifestations, uh, which can precede the extra intestinal manifestations, including arthralgias, neurologic and cardiac involvement, and even hypothyroidism. So I'll stop there, but so many amazing, amazing uh, teaching points, and I learned so much from this case. Madalena, incredible teaching, very structured. Uh, thank you for those. I just want to take a minute for everyone to reflect. It's like, you know, when you run a highlight reel after a sporting event, before I give you the highlight reel, I want to just say, um, Andrew, like your preparation of this case is still like, for me, what was the highlight of the entire um, exercise? But if you were to take the highlight reel, rewind this maybe 10 minutes. Of all the organisms I've mentioned, 
there's only one that could have a 15 year duration and that's Whipple's disease. That's what Ravi said. And that one sentence would be the highlight. And it tells you understanding tempo is key, but um, yeah, strive to be, I, I would say anyone could do it, but you just have to work really hard. So very nice, my mathematician. Your math added up this time. <laughs> Reza is here, Reza is there, and Reza is truly everywhere. But now I have to add a time dimension to this. So I'll have to, I'll have to add an addendum to your space presence everywhere. And yeah, Andrew, that was superb. Thank you so much for an incredibly enlightening case. I know Anne-Marie and Kushal have been waiting two years on VMR for Whipples, and I'm so sad that they're both not here. So we'll have to- Oh, no. Yeah, we'll both have to let them know. <laughs> Um, that it, it finally showed up on July 1st. Happy new intern uh, resident attending day for everybody and what a way to celebrate it. All right, y'all take care.